I believe we're about ready to start here. First of all, do any of our panelists have any suggestions, questions? Should I wait for the panelists? Uh, I have a uh, question for uh, Dr. Callahan. Um, a uh, real Nobelist in uh, economics, uh, Robert Sola, once quipped, uh, if you're traveling from Boston to Los Angeles, the first thing you need to know is head west. Uh, let me be, you have said that you are object uh, or find flawed the um, underlying ethos of unlimited technological advance. But I'd like to go back to Boston and just go to the beginning of the trip. Uh, there is research now going on to find uh, effective treatments for different forms of cancer. Um, we are reportedly reasonably close to finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there have been spectacular advances in the last half century in the treatment of coronary disease. One could go on and on. We can now do uh, organ transplants, uh, joint transplants of various kinds. Uh, we're investing a lot now to make further advances. Which of those would you stop? Uh, cancer. You would not try it's, to find a cure for cancer? No, I, w I, would, I would reduce the amount of research money put into a search for a cure of cancer and transfer it to Alzheimer's or other conditions because it's mainly a, it's a disease that kills mainly the elderly, and I would say for, for just that reason, you can devote less money to it than diseases that affect other age groups. Let me pursue that okay. a bit. Uh, let me, uh, for the sake of argument, okay. say I agree with you okay. on the allocation. Mm -hmm. uh, the reallocation, I presume, is to achieve a more effective and more rapid advance of medical technology, not to abandon the principle of it. Uh, if one is in favor of research mm -hmm. for specific diseases mm -hmm. uh, that would find cures or ways of forestalling them, mm -hmm. why don't we just let it go at that and see what we can do? And if at some point, 50, 75 years from now, mm -hmm. we reach some frontier that is problematic, we can reconsider it at that point. Well, I, I think we have reached that frontier now because we will not be able to control our health care costs and deliver good health care to people unless we decide we have reached the frontier or we're pretty close to it. And in the very nature of medical progress, there will always be a frontier, right? I mean, it seems to me every year testimony of the National Institutes of Health is this is we have more greatest prospects ever before. So that's the standard line. And I have no doubt, first of all, that if we even cure the diseases you mentioned, uh, that others will take their place, that if everybody's living to 100 years, the doctor's offices will still be filled and people will be complaining and saying we need more research. I'm saying at some point, what do you do when you have infinite possibilities? One of the analogies I didn't use in my talk was the exploration of outer space. The pursuit of, of better health is like the exploration of outer space. However far you go, there's always further you can go. And I'm saying that we now begin to see some of the economic limits of going that way. Uh, and we may have to uh, actually begin rationing research money, and we may have to ration care of things we know will work. To me, the problem is, is the great problem with costs are, is this, the stuff that really is effective, not the things that don't work, and we're, we're getting better and better. And we may not find a cure for cancer, but we're surely going to find more and more expensive ways to treat the cancer. And, of course, we see right now we're getting very expensive uh, cures or ways of ameliorating cancer, but it doesn't cure it, and that's likely to continue for a while. But so I, I'm saying at some point, yeah, we're always going to have to make a sacrifice of some further benefit, but maybe now is the big time to begin thinking of doing that. Well, then, on the recent uh, history of the past couple of years should be terrific news. Yeah. Flatlining of the uh, NIH budget has resulted in a reduction in the proportion of grant applications approved mm -hmm. by more than half. Yeah and a reduction in the number of continuation grants uh, approved by more than a third. Uh, we're well on our way under current policies 
to choking off. Well, that's about the first budget reduction in the like 40 years of that program. It had a golden life, and the fact that now the real world is catching no, no, no. up to it. No, no, no. The uh, application rate is lower than it has been in decades. No, no. I mean, the Dr. Osterholm. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Callahan for what I thought was a very clear and concise discussion of the issues. One additional piece that I would add is I, I, I worry desperately that we are a rudderless ship in this discussion. We continue to bring up the term death. You know, death is inevitable. Mm -hmm. We bring up the term death from breast cancer or prostate cancer. That is not a singular term. A male who dies of prostate cancer at 52 or 55 is very different than a man who's diagnosed with prostate cancer at 85 potentially or breast cancer. They're different cancers. There are different illnesses in the sense that I wish Dr. Bishop was here. He could talk to that degree about what do you research on. You know, you know, if I'm 82 and diagnosed with prostate cancer, I may tell you to leave it alone and I'll die with it, but it'll be not what I die from. And so part of the problem is we've had a hard time distinguishing within what it is we die from. If I were to die at age 75 while I scuba dive off the Cayman Islands and I'm down at 120 feet and all of a sudden I go and they bring out a smile on my face, is that worse than if I died 85 additional years while I've been in a nursing home bed tied to that bed to protect myself or myself for the last two years? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the issues we haven't dealt with is death is inevitable, so therefore what should we deal with? And one of the things, Dan, mm -hmm. I guess I'd ask you to comment on is that, you know, we've tried moving much more away from death to disability-adjusted life years. Mm -hmm. The idea that there are lots of conditions out there we should be doing research for but that, in fact, you know, living 20 years in agony, pain, and total disability, mm -hmm. is that better than me dying from my Cayman Island heart attack? Because, in mm -hmm. fact, I would be considered mm -hmm. a failure no, no. from a cardiology no, no. standpoint if I died scuba diving mm -hmm. at 75. How can we start to bring some measure to this? It's beyond just the very crude measure right. of death. Or yeah, no, well, I, I, I would say we, we really need a serious discussion about priority setting in research, uh, not only in research but in healthcare delivery. And the, one of the advantages of universal health care systems, they force you to set some priorities because you have a limited budget you have to work with. We don't, and hence it's very hard to have priorities. The National Institutes of Health has had, in the late 90s, had some discussions about setting priorities. Not, not didn't get very far, I think, but they, they tried. So I would start there, and I guess I would put it to you, and this isn't a challenge, just a question. If we have a, a budget that did not expand and we had to do more, support more of the things that you were talking about today, where would you where what would you cut the money from? <laughs> well, and, and I think that in fact that's a, a very real point. I, and mm -hmm. we need to first of all, we have got to get world population under control. Mm -hmm. That is going to drive many of our health mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And you know, I said earlier, you know, basically I think investing what you said in some of the high cancer cost research areas or some of the other mm -hmm. areas out there. You know, I think it's in the basic sanitation. Some of those things, I'd definitely move that. Oh, yeah. I think the other area is, is I would look at those diseases, again, which are disability-causing and death combined mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus just death. And then I would even look at yeah, yeah. death. It's not simple enough to have ten top, top ten causes of death mm -hmm. because they're so different. Finally, yeah. I think the last piece I would do is I would examine really what we're trying to do in the area of medicine. And I come from the University of Minnesota and mm -hmm. is as being outspoken, I'm sure I'll hear about this when I get back to my campus, but we're one of the problems. Because on one hand, we're talking about affordable health care. We try to educate our physicians. On the other hand, we love high-tech medicine. Yeah. We do all the research we can and bring in all the dollars we can. Those are inconsistent. Mm -hmm. We have to acknowledge at some point they are. Oh, and no, I no. think we're at the start of it. So I think that part of it is just changing the mindset to, to well, even I'm, have this discussion, yeah, well, which I know you've done. But then no, it's no. from that discussion, then what are we really trying to measure? What are we trying to do? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think, I mean, that's why I, I press for, for what, what, let's decide what are the real fundamental goals. Oh, what are the values? Uh, instead of trying to think, well, we'll keep the present. We don't want to look at the values, but we, we can if, we just do it all more efficiently. Well, that's the dead end. That's what has not worked, you know. Dr. West? I guess you've made an assertion that we're healthier now than we ever have been. And yet, when I look at the world, I see increasing rates of type 2 diabetes, even in young children, dramatic increases in diabetes. I don't see America being in a healthier state now. And mm -hmm. so I, I just challenge that assertion and wonder what facts and data you've based that on. Well, I certainly increased life expectancy. That's the fundamental one right there. Not, not, well, not all of which can be attributed to medical care. 
Uh, there's been a great deal of talk in recent years about actually maybe it's been the elderly primarily, but a decline in disability. Uh, so there are some uh, things of that sort. But uh, in, in recent, I guess in recent years, hasn't the U.S. life expectancy slightly dropped? I don't believe it has. I think it's. Uh, yeah, no, I think I actually both both of you are right. Uh -huh. But it's 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 a situation where it's where mm -hmm. we're at in time. Yeah. Dr. Callahan's right in that life expectancy in many areas of the world where HIV doesn't exist in its hyperendemic form, life expectancies can do increase. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're like a, a car crash where we basically have just had the initial impact and the head's not gone through the windshield yet. <laughs> so we're in that time period right now. With the obesity issues you just talked about yeah. and with the behavior issues yeah, right yeah. now, the life expectancy, we believe, mm -hmm. in the next 20 years is going to precipitously drop in a number of areas. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, I mean, we're on a collision course with destiny right now between the baby boomers, which are going to push on the top side, and the obesity epidemic, and the issues we now see on the bottom side. We're going to see incredible health care costs start to develop that we haven't yet accounted for. Mm -hmm. So you're right right now. Mm -hmm. You're right 10 to 15 years from now. And I don't think those have anything to do with technology. They don't. I, I think those things we face in the aging of our population and the health care issues we're going to face with well, obesity. Well, I think it would be very I – don't, I don't know the figures. It would be interesting to compare the amount of money doing medical research on diabetes over against research to reduce obesity. That would be – because I think that it's a – I consider obesity a public health problem. Whereas the emphasis says stem cell research, we're going to find cures for these diseases. And I'll bet the money spent on the medical money is more than the pre prevention money. I don't know. I think right. There's a question from the audience. Uh, what is going to be the tipping point in health care that will cause politicians to invest in universal health care? Oh, gosh, that's the uh, question that's been asked for years. I guess my uh, assumption is that uh, middle class people are previously well covered begin to begin to feel the pain, and uh, and th that may be approaching as more companies reduce health care benefits or cut programs, and, and uh, also, I mean, the bankruptcy figures I mentioned are very, very striking, that that's a very reality in people's lives. On the other hand, there's still the anti-tax sentiment in this country. Uh, uh, there are lots of, and the medical profession is going to have mixed feelings about universal health care, and the conservatives ha would hate the idea, so it's like it would and take a Can I ask Dr. Aaron a question about sure, that? Sure. I, ask yours? I mean, I think as Dr. Callahan just laid out, I mean, what is it? We hear consistently from the private sector that health care cost, even as they pass it through to their workers, still the residual that they have to pick up is basically causing us to become less and less a player in the global just-in-time economy because many other countries don't put that burden directly on the private sector. So that, in fact, mm -hmm. is that what's going to drive us ultimately is our lack of competitiveness. Not that we won't pay it. It's just mm -hmm. how we pay it. And, and does the private sector increase cost issues, cause concern that will mean that's what will be the tipping point? Um, first, a fact. Um, the uh, proportion of total health care spending covered by third-party payment, that is to say by private insurance mm -hmm. or government programs, is almost constant in recent years. Uh, the complaints about out-of-pocket payments are genuine. They are going up. They're going up because total health care spending is going up, and a portion of that is falling on individuals, and people react to that. But uh, we're not sort of becoming uninsured as a nation uh, in, a, in any aggregate or perceptible way. Now, as for competitiveness here, uh, there are some things that economists believe. They believe down to their shoes. Nobody else does. Uh, I'm reminded of the old quip of that there was a movement in the United States in favor of what was called metropolitan government, uh, cities and all the surrounding area. Everybody was for them, for that, except the cities and the suburbs. Well, uh, when it comes to the issue of competitiveness, um, uh, economists, almost to a person, believe that rising health care spending is not a significant component of the competitiveness of U.S. firms abroad. Why is that? Uh, not instantly, not smoothly, not completely evenly. If health care costs go up, either wage growth slows or some other fringe benefit 
uh, growth slows. Uh, the total compensation of workers as a share of total output would go up if health care costs were driving the total amount paid to workers, but it isn't. In fact, total payments to workers have been flat to trending down a slight bit uh, in recent years. Uh, workers are getting as a share of total, what economists call value added, the total value of production, a somewhat smaller share of the total pie uh, than has been uh, true in the uh, recent past. Well, that means there are offsets going on here. Now, there are some big exceptions to what I just said. If you're an old company like uh, General Motors, uh, Ford, U.S. Steel, Alcoa, and you have a big retired workforce to whom huge promises have been made, that's a liability of the company. De facto, GM is probably insolvent because of the liabilities for future health care costs that have not been recognized on the balance sheet. That certainly affects their ability to borrow funds, to invest in new de uh, uh, developing new cars, and hence in their ability to compete in the international automobile market. But for the most part, accepting those old Rust Belt companies with large what are called legacy costs, uh, rising health care spending simply means you have less of your total compensation left over to take home and spend on things other than health care. And hence, it doesn't, to a significant degree, affect international competitiveness of U.S. companies. Now, I say that every economist believes that. I don't think you could find anybody representing organized labor or business in the United States who would say, right on, Henry, you've got it right. They would disagree. <laughs> Uh, almost uh, unanimously. I have a question here from a, uh, I would guess that this must be a physician. Okay. Please name one specific medical advance, such as defibrillators, bypass surgery, or another device or treatment that adds to medical cost without evidence of efficacy. Uh, give me the list of, uh, I'm sorry, efficacy. Uh, uh, the, the thing is something, you, we can have an economic crisis of something that is efficacious. And to me, that's the real problem. Is That's what I mentioned with the evidence-based mm -hmm. medicine. We're going, we are turning up things that the cost is, seems to be absolutely worth it. And this is a question I have for economists. Many economists seem to say, if, 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 the, cost, if, if the cost and the benefits balance, then it's a good, good buy. And I say, well, but maybe you can't afford it. The cost and benefits of a Rolls Royce, that balances pretty well, too. But most of us can't afford a Rolls Royce. So... And it seems to me the question is, it may well be that there are things that are deep beneficial but are so expensive that they create fits on, of another kind. Uh, but in your talk, you specifically said that there were unproven technologies. Oh, well, that's very general. But, I mean, I'm saying something that's been standard uh, in healthcare for a long time. There are plenty of them out there. There isn't a technology you can think of, including the ones mentioned, that isn't beneficial for somebody Mm -hmm. and isn't used in other situations where the benefits are negligible. Mm -hmm. uh, we as individuals pay very little when we're seriously ill for the cost of that technology. So if it helps, give it to me. That's my incentive. It's my physician's incentive. So the problem with technology, mm -hmm. in my view, is not that it's advancing, but that we use it indiscriminately. We don't use it predominantly, overwhelmingly, in cases where benefits are demonstrable, we use it to a dis most technologies, over we overuse them in a large number of cases where the benefits are uh, negligible. If you get me going, I can tell you two, a couple of personal anecdotes that reinforce that, but this is well, I, I, tell you, I mean, one, the European experience indicates that they do have less available technology, but in fact their health, they get equally good or better health outcomes, which certainly supports your position. Uh, All right, well, one more question here. Uh, does the Oregon method of delivery of health care, uh, does this fit your vision for health care, or is there any other particular model that seems to attract your attention? Well, the Oregon, uh, I have not been able to really find out what's happened. In recent years, I gather it's more or less fallen apart. They've had all sorts of economic problems out there. I think, in theory, it was a great thing. There were complaints that it was devoted to aiming at Medicaid and thus going to 
hit the poor, but the point is it was a closed system. That the only way you can set priorities is that you have a system that has to live within a budget. So I thought it was a good, a good experiment. Now, apparently it fell apart for lots of reasons I've never been able to discover. Maybe is, is there any particular system that you find is a well, possible? Well, I, I hear uh, a number of countries, I would say there are 10 or 12 countries around the world that have tried to set priorities, at least for health care delivery. And they've developed nice reports and everything else. And what's very interesting is, though, in no case has the government accepted the recommendations. And I've decided, because and this is a, a notion of politics, that most politicians and legislators are not waiting around for some uh, elegant, formal, academically driven ideas. They like the hurly-burly of politics. And that's why the National Institutes of Health, was, they talked about setting priorities. But in fact, in the end, there was a kind of a black box, what they did. and was not clear how they finally decided what went to cancer, what went to heart. And, uh, okay. No. Well, I think we've gone about a half an hour on our Q&A here. Uh, I'd like to have us all stand and give a last round of applause here for our speakers today. Thank you for a very enlightening day. What percent of GDP is in that What percent of GDP is in that And we'll begin tomorrow again.